Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today at the Morphe Auction Company taking a look at a little baby Striker 12 shotgun. Now, we're going to go through a couple of different things here today. First, we're going to talk about where this came from, what the history is, then we're going to talk about how it actually works, and then we're going to come back and talk about what is the legal status of this thing in the United States and why, because it is one of a couple weird specific exemptions under US law. So to start with its history, this was originally designed by a guy named Hilton Walker in Rhodesia, although by the time he was actually building them, he had emigrated to South Africa. So he came up with the idea in the late 70s. By the early 80s, he was getting into the process of putting them into production. This was introduced, the Striker 12, uh, in 1983 in South Africa. Now, he didn't do this on his own, as is typical for this sort of work. Uh, Hilton Walker was the, the brains guy, the technical guy who came up with the idea. He then found a guy named Hoffman, who owned Armcell, a company called Armcell, to finance the project. And then they found a third company called Aserma Manufacturing to actually build the things. So that was the, the basic overview of that. The idea that Walker had come up with was basically a high capacity 12 gauge shotgun. If you want to have, say, 12 rounds of shotgun ammunition in a traditional, typical tube magazine shotgun, it's going to have a barrel about five feet long. However, if you instead use a rotary drum, you can have 12 rounds in this much more compact package. Now, it's a little awkward because it's very wide, but still way more compact than your than a tube-fed version of the same thing. So that was kind of the core. And then in order to cycle the thing, you didn't want to have it operate like a traditional revolver where pulling the trigger is what physically turns the cylinder because the cylinder on this is just too big and bulky. Even though it's only made of aluminum, not steel, still that would give you a terrible trigger pull. So instead he got the idea to give it a wind up like a clock spring. So you load the thing and then you crank it, wind it up, and then when you pull the trigger, instead of having to physically turn the drum, all it has to do is open up a latch to allow the spring to rotate the drum by itself. One position every time you pull the trigger. So you basically have a double action revolver style of trigger pull. You have a 12 round capacity. You can fire the first 12 rounds very quickly, but then you've got a little bit of a long reloading process. Now to help reduce the reloading time, he gave this an auto ejecting feature. So it will actually kick out 11 of the 12 fired cases. The way that works is pretty simple. It's just a little bit of gas tapped off of the barrel and vented into the chamber that previously fired. So uh, when you fire the first round, nothing ejects and the cylinder rotates one position. And now you have an empty chamber or an empty round in the chamber that's right next to this ejection port. When you fire round number two, some of the gas is vented into chamber number one and that ejects empty case number one. This continues through until by the time you fire the last cartridge, you have no empty case remaining. Uh, and so the last cartridge stays in the chamber and you use this manual ejecting rod to punch it out. You then still have a fairly lengthy reloading process because you have to go through and you have, I'll show you this in a moment. You have to go through and manually load each chamber one at a time kind of like a gate loading revolver and then wind the thing back up. But once you do, relatively fast to use. Now, he intended this for the security and law enforcement market. And there are a number of other benefits that came from having this design. Most notably, it didn't matter what kind of power the different cartridges had. If you want a self-loading, a semi-automatic shotgun, they're always, they're often a little finicky about exactly what ammunition. If you want to have, say, full power buckshot, because you're the police, but you also want to be able to shoot, say, less lethal rubber slugs or beanbag rounds, because you're the police, those two are not necessarily going to both operate the gun equally well. Your beanbag rounds are probably going to be underpowered and not cycle a semi-auto shotgun well. Well, there's nothing to cycle here. The auto ejecting feature is requires just a tiny bit of, of energy compared to a, a proper semi-automatic action. So you can load this with well, you could load this with blanks and it would run just fine. So that's a nice benefit for the law enforcement market. Um, although, of course, he was also interested in civilian sales. And the problem that he ran into with the first version of this gun was that the South African police decided to regulate it as if it were semi-automatic. I think they saw it as it fires every time you pull the trigger, it ejects the empty cases. Pretty obvious, that's a semi-automatic shotgun. 
and that made it difficult for him to market, uh, to sell, more heavily regulated. So uh, in the late 1980s, he went through the process of coming up with an, a, a version of the gun that retained all the features he liked, but would be regulated as a manually operated shotgun, which would make it a lot easier to sell. Uh, he came up with that in like 89, 90, 1991, uh, the company formally introduced it onto the market. They called it the Protecta instead of the Striker. And what he did was he got rid of the clock spring and instead built a ratcheting sort of mechanism into the barrel shroud and front grip. So after you fired a shot, you would take the front grip and you'd twist it about 20 degrees off to the side and that would manually index the cylinder. That was enough for the South African police to redesignate, well, not to redesignate, but to classify that weapon as a manually operated shotgun, which made it a lot easier for him to sell. Of course, better, easier to sell may not have worked out as well as he hoped. In total, they only made six or seven hundred of these in South Africa. However, they were also exported to the United States, as well as a variety of other countries. Now, here in the U.S., we didn't really have, like, manually operated shotguns and semi-auto shotguns were treated the same. So they didn't bother to go with the Protecto, with that manually operated click-clack sort of front grip uh, mechanism. Instead, uh, the U.S. market was much more interested in the wind-up version, and that's what came here, brought in by a company called Sentinel Arms, and that's what we have right here. So let's take a closer look at this, and I'll show you how it works. All right, first off, a couple of markings. We have Sentinel Arms Corporation, Ridgeway, Pennsylvania, there on the front strap. It is designated a Striker 12 in little tiny text right on the side of the barrel. In much bigger text, they have all of this warning stuff printed onto the rear of the frame. Now, this one is actually set up to have a little laser mounted on it. Uh, if you didn't have that, you would have a trough here to use in conjunction with this front blade sight. Of course, this one doesn't have a shoulder stock, so the sights are kind of a afterthought anyway. There are a number of controls on this to use. First off, we have a cross bolt safety here. So that's safe. That is fire. And this has a very kind of clunky feeling, unusual sort of trigger because uh, every time you pull the trigger, it's going to fire around and then the whole cylinder goes chunk one position. We have this button on the back and what this does is cycle the cylinder one position without engaging the firing pin. So this is what you would use for loading the gun. And it's getting sluggish, yeah, and it's it's totally out of juice. So we switch around to the front where we have this winding key. I can wind. I can wind that up about two and a half turns. That will now give it plenty of spring tension to cycle through a couple times. So the loading process is you put a shell in, Click at one position, put a shell in. You repeat this process until the thing is fully loaded with 12 rounds. You do have little witness holes for like 10 of the, the positions. You then flip that up. Uh, that's just a little gate that prevents the last shell you put in from falling out should you lift the gun muzzle up. The first time that the action cycles, that gate is dropped down because as soon as the action cycles, it's going to vent gas into this chamber and eject whatever empty cartridge is in there. Or if there's no cartridge in there, nothing will happen. This plastic box is here to catch the ejected shell so it kind of comes ka-chunk back into here and then just falls out. When you get to the last round that you fired, you use the manual ejector, ro ejector rod to pull that one out. Then you can uh, load the thing up and rewind it. All right, now the legal status of these things is a little bit weird. In 1994, these guns, the Striker 12s, as well as the Cobra Street Sweeper and the Daewoo uh, USAS 12 were all designated by the Secretary of the Treasury as being destructive devices. That su uh, subjected them to regulation under the National Firearms Act. You have to pay a $200 tax and go through an elaborate background check to uh, transfer possession of one of these guns. How did that happen? Well, the way the, uh, the way US law is written, all firearms over a half inch of bore diameter are considered destructive devices, except for shotguns and guns suitable for sporting purposes. 
Now, as a general rule, this was never really exploited as a way to restrict ownership of shotguns. All shotguns just got exempted. If it fired a 12-gauge shell, it's not a destructive device. That was just kind of standard policy. Well, in the early 90s, there were groups that were lobbying for change to some of these, the interpretation of these regulations, and they saw drum-fed shotguns like the Street Sweeper and the Striker, probably in part because of its dumb sounding, scary sounding name for the street sweeper, uh, people found these particularly frightening looking guns. And so they petitioned to have the, uh, the administration, the executive, uh, redesignate them as destructive devices. Because as it actually turns out, it's up to executive authority to make that decision. Um, so the secretary of the treasury in 1994 looked at it and came to the conclusion that guns like this Specifically, this, the Street Sweeper, and the USAS-12 were not suitable for sporting purposes and thus uh, redesignated them as destructive devices because they have barrels over a half inch in diameter. Now, people often wonder why these guns and not other high capacity drum fed shotguns that are available today, like the Saiga-12. The answer is simply that gun wasn't there at the time. Nobody was asking the government to ban that one. It wasn't on the list. Didn't get banned. These did. So. Today, uh, these are legally considered destructive devices and they have to go through basically the same transfer process as machine guns or silencers or short-barreled rifles. This does add an interesting twist. When these were brought in, the standard version had an 18-inch barrel and a folding shoulder stock so that it wouldn't be considered a short-barreled shotgun and subject to the NFA. Well, once it becomes a destructive device, the barrel length is no longer legally relevant. And so the barrel length can be made anything that people want. And that's why this, these were initially marketed just to law enforcement because otherwise they would have been considered short-barreled shotguns and the, the NFA process is a hassle. And so there wasn't much potential for uh, private sale of them. Today, this and the long barrel version are both treated exactly the same. Uh, and by the way, if you're wondering why on earth law enforcement would want this, this is actually a fairly practical breaching gun because it's compact, holds plenty of ammunition if you consider if you're going to breach a door, you might need only one round, but maybe there's multiple hinges. Maybe there's a second door inside the building that you're gonna to have to breach as well. Having 12 rounds available to do that means you can probably go through whatever your mission is without having to reload the thing. So for all of its association with Cobra and stupidness, there are some legitimate practical applications to this guy. So. Uh, hopefully, you guys enjoyed this look at what is kind of a weird, oddball, outlier sort of uh, sort of shotgun in today's market. I think they have a pretty cool history. Um, and uh, well, if you're interested in this one, you can find out a bit more about it by taking a look at Morphe's catalog. Uh, there are, of course, always a tremendous number of very interesting firearms there that you can check out. Hopefully, you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.